just real quick, today's presentation is going to be really technical, super uber geeky. If you're not into broadcast switching formats, all this crap, just skip. Come back tomorrow. Um, you're warned. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment of Sorts. So normally, of course, this is a live show, and today it is not, because today's live show was going to be the live broadcast of my Chamber of Commerce greeters meeting that I, for some strangely, ridiculously stupid idea uh, reason, decided to the uh, broadcast live didn't work. So we're going to get into the technicalities of what did and didn't work. I want to tell you first about what we attempted to do, what we did do, and then I'm going to show you some of the footage that we got. I'm not going to show you the whole hour and a half readers. I'll just show you some little highlights, and uh, and then we'll we'll get into the nitty gritty of what didn't work and what went wrong and why. So let's start off with what the basic setup was. First of all, what is greeters? Uh, I'm a member of the local Chamber of Commerce. We have weekly greeters meetings, it's called, where chamber members can come together and uh, powwow about business and so on. And the whole, and really the whole thing is that the greeters, you get 30 or 40 seconds, something like that, to stand up in front of the room, talk about your business, what it is you're promoting, you're selling, so on and so on. And the whole thing is for businesses to be able to work together. So if you're like a massage therapist and there's a hotel and you guys can get together and the hotel can promote your services and vice versa, that kind of thing. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Anyway, so that's what Greeters is. And, and every week it's hosted a different place. And this week I had offered to host it here months ago. At the time, because I'm clearly an idiot, I said, I have an idea. Why don't we stream it live? Because as you have clearly seen, I have all this tech for doing live streaming. And it's been kind of fun and interesting. And I thought it would be really interesting to set it up so that instead of just you know me in my little studio by myself, we're going to set it up out in the big shooting studio, do a multi-camera switching thing. And it's one where I don't actually have to be on camera. Well, at least not the whole time. I don't know how to you know, do my presentation. But I'm not on camera while switching. I can go sit down at a desk and just do the switching side. This would be really interesting. And if nothing else, it will be a learning experience. And that it most certainly was. So let's talk about the setup itself. We did three cameras. I had a long lens GH4. It's actually not this one now, it's kind of up there. But anyway, long lens GH4 that was on the person talking, the, the greeter, the, um, what do you call it? Anyway, the business person who's talking. We had a same pointing in the same direction, slightly wider shot that showed the hosts, which were standing right over here. We had two hosts, that's the way these things go. And then a shot that was basically where this camera is, a POV of the actual presenter, of the person talking, so that they could see the audience, the crowd. Those are the three camera angles. These were all lock shots. We didn't have manpower to man each camera, move it, zoom it, pan it, so on. So we picked lock shots. Uh, let's see here. So that's picture, three cameras. The sound was handled through a variety of microphones. The two hosts were wearing wireless labs like I am now. Then the person who would stand in here to do the presentation, they had a taped off box on the floor, stand here. Not everybody did. What are you going to do? And they had a boom mic that is just, just uh, it's a little somewhere in there. Anyway, they had a boom mic in there. So don't run out of battery. And that way they could get in and you know do their thing and not have to mic up or anything like that. I guess that's all that. So then the audio is all routed into a mixing board. And I'm in the back, and I got my hands on the faders, so I can bring up or down the levels of the hosts as they're talking if needed, uh, but primarily so I can adjust the levels of the boom mic as people come in and either talk loudly or more quietly than others, or are taller or shorter than others and therefore farther from the mic. We didn't have somebody moving the mic. So that was the mic configuration. Oh, and also on two of the three cameras, we had a, a just a little on-camera boom mic just to pick up ambient sound, pick up the crowd, so that I can mix that in as well. One of the problems, just a little precursor to this, was that these mics were fed into the camera, feeding directly into the switcher, whereas the, uh, fed into the switcher along with the video signal, whereas the audio from the mics in the boom, with the labs in the boom, were going into a mixer and then straight into the console. So two different things there, and that's going to be important later, so don't forget that. Uh, let's see here. So that was the basic technical setup. Oh, OK, so let's talk about the switching. So I had uh, the three cameras to switch between. I got my ATEM switcher, the, you know, this control panel. I've kind of shown this to you guys a bit before. And actually on the iPad, because I can do touch interface on there to control all this. For the most part, it was just very simple, one, two, three camera angles. But I did build a macro, build macros for them, because on the tight shot here, we did a lower third. So as people came in, dropped their business cards in a basket, my assistant would grab piles of them and number them one through whatever. It was 50. We had 50 people. So one through 50 as they came in. And then I had set up a Photoshop file where she could type in their name, and that would generate a lower third. So here's a, a kind of sidestep here, but 
total pro tip here, and this is from my buddy Chris Fenwick. So Chris, super thanks for sharing this one with me. In Photoshop, if you create a group, so like a folder, right, in Photoshop, and you name it bob.png, and then you turn on, under the file menu, I think it is, generate image assets, you just enable that box. Any group, and I guess just any file, any layer, if it's just a single layer or it's a group, then you have more options. If you name it something something .png, it will generate in virtually instant real time a PNG file in a folder next to the Photoshop file in the Finder, that file. So for doing things like lower thirds on the fly, we created a Photoshop document with 50 or so folders in them, named 1.png, 2.png, and so on. And inside of that folder was a, a the title of the name, the little black bar for the lower third, and another super pro tip, create the, doc, the document at 1920 by 1080, size of the yeah, size of our broadcast. Again, this one's from Chris. If you, um, and by the way, Chris Fen if you're into Final Cut and editing, Chris Fenwick, you gotta look up his podcast, FCPX Grill, Final Cut Pro 10 Grill, FCPX Grill. Check it out, awesome podcast. I was actually on it recently, so there you go. And that's not why it's awesome. Um, anyway, so you got this 1920 or document. If you just make a lower third and put the title on there and that's all that's in the layer or the group, when it exports out as a PNG, the PNG file will be just like this. It's not gonna be the full 1920 by 1080. So if you take that PNG file that's just this and you drop it onto a timeline in Final Cut or you drop it into the switcher, the ATEM switcher, it will just plop it right in the middle of the screen. So to get it to position where you want, you have to basically corner pin it. You go and you make another layer with just one pixel in bottom left and the top right corner, wherever in the corners. You can fade it down to 1%. It's gonna be invisible, no one will ever see it. And those little pins there become part of the file and force you to have a 1920 by 1080 file. So your lower third stays where you want. Okay, total pro tip, Keep check that out, it's awesome. Anyway, now back to this. So my assistant's making these. She's, as she types in the names, it's generating out these PNG files across the network. I'm seeing them come in, one, you know, Photo Joseph, Photo Joseph Studios, two, Sean Nipper, Real House Films, and so on. So I've got these files that I can drag into my switching software. So basically the way the switching would work is we'd have a, a wide shot on the audience, right? And the hosts start to call the next person. So I cut to the shot of the hosts and they say, Sean Nipper, Real House Films, although he was one of the hosts, but anyway, so they'd say the name. While that's happening, I know who's gonna be next because I got the numbered files. The business cards themselves are numbered and been handed to the host in even and odd piles. So they go you know, back and forth, back and forth. They call the next one. I know which one's next. I've dragged that file into the switcher. And then when I switch to this camera angle, the tight angle on them, it's already got the lower third loaded. So it's there. As soon as I cut away from that angle, because I'm using macros, it turns that off. So now we've got the wide shots again without the lower third. Rinse and repeat. Worked out really well. Only had a couple of uh, couple of hiccups along the way, but for the most part, it worked out really well. So that's super cool. Okay, so that's, see, I'm leaving, leaving anything out. That is how everything worked. I sat in a corner of the room with my setup, my multi-up monitor, seeing all the camera sources at once, the iPad to do the, the switching, uh, the laptop to do the, the lower third dragging in, and then the mixing console to do the mixing. Okay, that all worked great. Now we're gonna get into the part that didn't work or what was wrong. But first, let me show you what we got. Again, I'm not gonna show you everything, just a few highlight reels, a few couple fun clips. And by the way, I did actually go live from my iPhone as a photo moment. So I'm sitting there with my phone, kind of doing all the switching, holding it, just for a couple minutes, just at the very end of it, just that I had something to show kind of a behind the scenes there. Okay, so watch this, and then we'll be back to talk about the technical goodies. I'd like to introduce you to my uh, mentor and also my friend, Photo Joseph. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to my studio. I know a lot of you have been here before, but a lot of fresh faces as well. So thank you for coming. And, uh, and again, welcome. The food, by the way, all baked by my wife this morning and last night. All homemade. And I was supposed to print out a sign for one of them, and I ran out of time. But the one that's dark with uh, berries on top is vegan gluten-free. There is a sign. Oh, good. Then she put it up. <laughs> Off the hook. Okay. So, uh, that said, what do I do? What is Photo Justice Studios? As you can see, we're a, a pretty good sized space here. We do photography and video production, largely more video production these days. Mostly commercial, some portraiture. But the truth is that uh, portraiture doesn't make a lot of money, and people don't want to pay what I want to charge for portraits. <laughs> so, I'm doing more and more commercial work, mostly video these days. Now, that means a lot of the work doesn't come from Ashland. I would love for all of you to hire me at some point, but uh, 
Uh, it doesn't always happen. However, the good news is that for all the work that I do that comes from clients all over the world, we bring a lot of money into Ashland. Photo Justice Studios has pushed out over $100,000 in the last couple of years into the local community as far as hiring editors, sound designers, musicians, bookkeepers, all the people that make this business run are hired, hired locally. I would say the vast, vast majority of who I hire is from Ashland. So that's a really cool thing about, the, about what we're doing here. So um, let's see, if you are looking for commercial photography, of course that is something that we do, still photography, so advertising for your website, for uh, advertising for your business, to put on your website, put in print ads, that sort of thing. And with that, I'm just gonna kick it off with a, uh, this has been playing on a loop, some of the work that I do. I'm gonna play a piece here that's only a couple minutes long. I hope I'm allowed to have this much time. I'm going to take it. Um, <laughs> this is for one of, my, um, one of my better clients, Panasonic. I did a video on the launch of a new camera. I've done a couple of them. The one I'm going to show you was shot in New Orleans earlier this year. I'm actually in the video because I was the featured photographer as well as the director in the video. So I hired from Ashland, I hired a producer that flew out to New Orleans with me, and then locally here also hired an editor, musician, and sound designer to help put it together. And then out in New Orleans we hired some staff, uh, some crew as well. But I wanted to show that one to you guys here. When it comes to street photography, New Orleans is one of the greatest cities I've ever explored. So much color, so much history, so many amazing people. Happy Tuesday! What's not to love? I took the GX85 everywhere, wandering the streets, to restaurants, museums, even on a horse-drawn carriage. And I love how this camera performed. It's so compact that I could easily fit the camera in two or three lenses in my little camera bag. The flip-up LCD allowed me to shoot from waist level, and the built-in stabilization kept my video nice and smooth. One of the standout features in this new camera is that there's no anti-aliasing filter on the sensor. It turns out this makes for amazingly sharp photos, which became really obvious when I shot in black and white. On the other hand, the richness of colors in this new Lumix really blew me away. I met this wonderful artist called Frenchie, and he invited me into his studio to shoot him working. The phenomenal colors of his artwork look so incredible on the back of my camera, and those intense colors look exactly the same when shooting 4K video. I love shooting at night, but I don't like carrying a tripod. So the dual stabilization in the GX85, where the sensor and the lens move together to keep shots steady, was awesome and allowed me to shoot handheld everywhere I went. Of course, not all photography is fast paced and taking time to explore the early morning light at the Beauregard Kai's house is a great example of that. Without a tripod, shooting handheld at a 20th of a second was easy, and my shots turned out perfectly sharp. I love food. So getting a few minutes to shoot in the kitchen of the famous Giacomo's restaurant was a blast. It's fast paced, and I was always in the way. But one of the latest developments in photography that was incredibly useful in this situation is 4K photo mode, which basically lets me shoot eight megapixel stills at 30 frames per second. Without a doubt, the highlight of my trip was seeing little Freddie King play the blues on a back porch in New Orleans. Everything came together here. The incredible colors that feel so right in this city. Jumping between video and stills by just pushing a different button. And of course, portraiture. My favorite moment and favorite photo from this visit is seen in this portrait. If there is ever a character that sums up the soul of New Orleans, it's Little Freddie King. Okay, bye-bye. I'm Photo Joseph, photographic storyteller and Lumix luminary. Panasonic. Thank you very much for that. That was actually the six minute version. I thought it was the three minute version, so sorry, I stole a few extra minutes there. <laughs> So that's it, that's what I do. If you want something like this for your business, um, add a zero and let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I am a filmmaker. My name is Sean Mark Nipper with Real House Films. And uh, last night I was working on a movie. We we're working on a post-apocalyptic film. Um, and then uh, I did that until midnight and then uh, I came here. <laughs> Joseph uh, kind of set this up. Terry Badenhop, Emerald Boutique Spa. I'm a massage therapist and esthetician.
Our Christmas auction is December 2nd. He's, he's using 36 days left until Christmas, and, and Graham lets us know all the time. Um, these are the two books about Ashlyn, and they make wonderful Christmas, Hanukkah, birthday gifts. Janai Mastrovich, a.k.a. Grandma Boom, Red Horse Hats. I donate a book to every hat that I decorate or sell. And according to Frank Sinatra, if you angle your hat, it means you've got an attitude. I changed my attitude. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh God, God, what goes on? Yeah. Next up, Ed Laskos with oh, Ashlyn oh. Tennis and Fitness Club. You're gonna have to like yeah. scrunch yeah. down. Yeah. 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 Lower the. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my lawyer? Call my lawyer. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I am Karen with So Humane, and this is my baby, Max. My name's Rob, and I sell advertising on Ashland Cable TV. Rhonda Robertson, Holman's Dead Senior Care. The MWR stands for Make Wealth Real. I've been in Portland the last two months directing up there. I go back next fall. What I do is I actually coach and mentor highly sensitive people. Hands and eyes of Be Inspired Studio, where your beauty inspires us. Is this it? Is this where I'm supposed to stand? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. We are having an open house coming up December 2nd at 5.30 to 7. Graham Lewis. Focus. And if 50 years ago they would have told me I could have this, I'd have never gone into psychology. God, this is great. I have missed you so much, and that's what makes you most grateful. When you're away from people and come back, you go, oh, gosh, you guys are so awesome. Tan Realty Group is founded on the principle of tithing. Starting January 9th at the YMCA here at Ashland, we're offering an eight-week course in public speaking. And all of a sudden, the place just filled up, and there were about 35 people there. Right. So, flash interview, um, what's the name of your property? It's now the 1900 house, and I also have a 1900 guest house. This is what a healed heart looks like and feels like. <coughs> I know, it's a big time. Uh, and now I go, oh my goodness, good morning again, Daniel Perry, come on up. Um, I can set up a calendar where you get paid to do that. So uh, we've got all these captive audience people. Um, let's make sure that they get the true Ashland experience. So um, come see me about that. We're launching that in January. Mm -hmm. I'm in. All right. Yay. 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 Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. On Main Street, we're going to go up the stairs. The Drake has told us that they will provide ADA access to the shop on that day. And they've also told me that so far they found no very monarchs or woolly mammoths in the excavation. Fantastic, all right. So pretty cool, right? That was a neat thing. It worked out well, it was fun, enjoyable, great. So why didn't we stream live? <laughs> hmm. So first, in my, what's the opposite of defense? In my offense, <laughs> last minute, as always, it's just been so busy around here. I planned on starting to set up for this thing earlier in the week. Didn't get to start setting up until yesterday. I only had two hours in the middle of the day free. The rest of the day was packed up. So I came back in here after my baby went to bed. Eight o'clock at night, I come in here to finish setting up, which is almost to start setting up. I was here till 2.30 in the morning. Sean, buddy, thanks for coming and helping me around midnight to help us finish this up. So what went wrong? So first off, the way that the ATEM switcher works, and now if you're not familiar with this thing, it's made by Blackmagic. This is the switching hardware. It's a big box that I use to do all the live switching in my live shows. It is a multi-input switcher thing. Anyway, that's what this software is controlling, is the ATEM. The way the ATEM works is you have to define a resolution and frequency, and every input has to match that exactly. There's no wishy-washy in or out of it. There's nothing. It has to be precise. So if you standardize on 1080p 29.97, so 1920 by 1080, progressive frame, 29.97 frames per second, every input has to be exactly that. It can't be 30. It has to be 29.97. It has to be exact. Okay. Now, that, I've known this. That's just the way the ATEM works, and that's fine. This is why. On my normal show, I standardize at 1080p24 because the Mac will not sync at 29.97. It syncs at 30 hertz. If you look in your, your settings, you'll see it has 30 hertz, 24 hertz, probably 60 hertz. And those are not 29.97, it's 30. It's not 59.94, it's 60. 24 is 24. Not 23.98, which is the common, oh, look, my camera is 24. No, it doesn't. It says 23.976. 
rounded to 2398. I told you this is getting geeky. And uh, anyway, so I've standardized on 24. The GH4s are cinema cameras that will actually clock at exactly 24, not 23. They do 2398 as well, but they do pure 24. So that's what I've standardized on in the studio. What The reason that I've done that is because it allows me to have the minimum number of devices that have to be scaled between the device and the ATEM. This, the laptop will go to full 24. The cameras will go to full 24. The only thing that doesn't in my broadcast is my iPad. The iPad outputs 1080p 59.94, so that I run through a scaler. That's it, it's the only device that has to run through a scaler. Okay, cool. So, where does that leave us? So now for this live broadcast, didn't have to worry about the computer. In retrospect, I don't know why I didn't just go back to 24. This is definitely one of those mistakes that are made when you're really tired, frustrated, can't figure things out, and you go down a rabbit hole, and instead of turning around and going back, you just keep going deeper. That is absolutely the mistake that I made last night. Once I realized that I was having a frequency issue, which I'm going to explain in a moment, I should have just backed up, gone back to 24. This is the only camera, the FC1000, that doesn't do pure 24, but I've got the scaler. I could have used it on there and been done with it, and the whole thing would have been fine. But I didn't. So what was the problem? So this, I decided that I was going to go to 2997 because that's totally common frame rate, right? That's NTSC broadcast, standard, standard, 2997. This camera, of course, does it. The GH4s, of course, do it. So that's easy. 2997 all the way through, plug into the ATEM and go. Except I plug them into the ATEM and they don't show up. <sighs> this is one of those like, really? Are you kidding me? Why isn't this working? So I keep on fussing around with that. I start doing some research. I find, now this is something I have to get to the bottom of still. And I'm going to throw this out there now, see, just to kind of clear the air here. Many of you know, and if you don't, now you do, I'm a Panasonic Lumix Luminary. It means I am, I am sponsored, if that's the word you want to use, by Panasonic. I was a Lumix shooter beforehand. They picked me up as a Luminary. I do presentations for them. I travel around the country doing talks for them. I use Lumix gear all the time, obviously, and I love it. I absolutely love their gear, and I share that love with the world. It's fun. This is not a moment of love. <laughs> what I found is that, so let's say you set your camera to 1080p 2997 or UHD 5994, whatever. That is what's recorded to the memory card, 100%. But what is output on the HDMI may not be. Now, I use this guy. This is the Blackmagic, uh, sorry, the uh, Atomos Ninja Assassin. I use this for recording in the field, in the studio, a lot of different places. I use it to record to here. This works perfectly with the GH4, and in my digging, I found a firmware update that referenced this specifically. So I think there are some compatibility additions that are made to sync up with this. So if you set the camera to one frequency, that's what shows up here every time. But not if you're not plugged into this. What I found is that some outputs don't actually match what it says on the tin. So when I put it at 1080p, 59, uh, 1080p 2997, what it was actually outputting was now, I might be wrong, I'm trying to remember now, it was all hazy last night, but it wasn't 1080p 2997, I think it was 1080i 5994. So, guess what happens? The ATEM doesn't see it. So I am going crazy trying to figure out how am I going to standardize this. I finally find a frequency and resolution that matches all three cameras and will sync with the device. 1080i 5994. Normally hate interlaced, doesn't matter for this, fine, it works, it looks good, I'm good to go. So I get everything set up, late last night, get it, get the sound, everything's working, come in this morning, ready to go live, and I switch over to my streaming hardware, and I see a green solid screen. Oh shit, so I don't know what's wrong. So I go in to look at, the way that, the way that my um, streaming setup is configured, from the Blackmagic ATEM, you have what's called the program out, this is what is being output. This is your the program. This is what the world is going to see or what's going to be recorded. The program out goes from the ATEM into a Blackmagic recorder. It's just a 1080p recorder. Normally, go straight into there, record that, and that's fine. On the back of the 1080p recorder, it has an HDMI out, which I then feed into my video hardware for streaming. And that's it. That's how that normally works. So in this case, the streaming hardware isn't seeing the signal. Oh, crap. I look at the Blackmagic box. It's not seeing the signal. Double O oh crap. 
Think about it, think about it. It must be the interlaced. Okay, I know this device can handle the interlaced, no problem. Yank the cable out of the black magic, stick it into here. It shows up, shows up perfectly. 1080i, 5994, it's all golden, it's beautiful, super. This has HDMI out. I spit this out into the VDU, and the picture comes up, but it's like this weirdly scaled half size and doubled. It's the interlace. The interlacing cannot be handled by the VDU. And that's fine. I, that's not a problem. It's just it's a limitation, whatever. Or maybe it's not a limitation. There's a setting that I didn't know to look for. In retrospect, now this is one of those, another look back and go, I could have fixed this so easily, so quickly. Again, using the scaler, I could have scaled the output from the Ninja at 1080i5994 to anything I wanted into the streaming hardware and it would have all worked perfectly. I also possibly could have run a cable from the Ninja into my Mac where I've got software that'll do the encoding and broadcasting, Wirecast. That might have worked, I don't know if it would, but I had already removed the cabling, so I was using the cabling somewhere else, so I couldn't do that. So I just, at this point, we're five minutes past start time, and I just go, we're not streaming. I'm gonna record, but we're not gonna stream. So that's why we didn't stream live. That was the super crazy, stupid technical reason that we did not stream live today. You didn't miss much, it was a long event, but anyway. So, there's that. Um, okay, now what else? Other technical challenges that are really interesting if you're into this sort of thing. <clears throat> so, audio, let's talk audio for a minute. I mentioned that the two labs, the two wireless labs and the boom mic were all feeding into a mixing board and that mixing board then feeds the auto straight into the console, into the ATEM. I also had, on these cameras, I think I mentioned, I had a microphone on two of these to pick up room audio. That means that that audio is being merged with the video signal and fed into the ATEM switcher. Here's an inherent problem with any camera, this isn't a Lumix, it's any camera, into the ATEM switchers. The HDMI processing takes time. It is, on these cameras at 1080p, it's about a four frame delay. It takes four frames for the content to get out. So if you're looking at a picture that's the output of here, whether you're plugging it into an ATEM, plugging it into this, whatever, you're getting something that's four frames later. The audio is synced with it, so nothing's out of sync, it stays in sync, so it doesn't matter. Who cares if the live broadcast show is four frames later than real time, that's fine. Uh, you know, if it was five minutes later than real time, that'd be a problem, but four frames, who cares? No one's gonna notice. As long as the audio and video stay in sync, you're all good. This is really getting down a rabbit hole here. The audio coming from the mixing console is going into the unit in real time. So now I've got a four frame difference between audio sources. I've got the audio is happening from these mics in real time, the audio coming from here at four frames off. It actually wasn't bad. At one point I started to hear it and I turned off one of the camera's audio because I could do that in the software in here and it was fine. It was not, certainly not an echo because it's only four frames. It's like a, a big room reverb and that was perfectly fine for what it was. So I didn't worry about that. But this is the reason that I have issues with audio every day that I do a live show. So deeper into the rabbit hole to understand what the, the challenge and the problem is. If you're doing a live show and you're just, you're the guy controlling the mixing board, it doesn't matter that things are four frames out. What you're gonna listen to, what you're gonna monitor is what's coming out of the switcher. You want to hear the program out because you wanna hear what the audience is gonna hear. This is critical, right? This means that it, you're listening to, oh, that mic got too loud, this one's too quiet, um, or is some other sound suddenly snuck in that shouldn't be there. You need to hear what the audience hears so you can adjust as needed. This is what I want to do when I'm broadcasting live. I want to hear what the audience is going to hear. The problem is that when my dialogue that's being routed through the camera so that it stays in sync, so that what you see is in sync, it's four frames later than real time, so that means it's feeding back into my ear four frames later than real time. If you ever have ever listened to yourself on a delay, you can't do it. You cannot talk. You feel like you're trying to talk over yourself, and I firmly believe that if you do this for too long, your brain will crawl out of your head and strangle you itself. You cannot, you just can't. So the, so what's the solution? Okay, so my solution is not a good one. What I need to be able to do is monitor the program out, but I just need to mute myself. Okay, so in my software, I should be able to say, monitor all channels except me but I can't. It's a limitation in the Blackmagic software. I've been begging them for over a year to add this feature in there. They keep saying things like, well, think about it, we told the engineers. Clearly not a priority, because I'm like the only guy who's doing this stupid broadcasting on himself on air. So what I end up doing on every show that you've seen me on is 
I am only monitoring one source, and that is the computer that I'm talking to people on when I'm doing live chats, interviews, whatever. That's the only one that I'm monitoring. See, in my in my software, in the ATEM software, I can uh, I can solo for monitoring. I can solo any one channel, but I cannot mute any one channel, and I cannot gang solo, meaning I can't say solo one and two and three, but leave the rest off. I can only solo one channel, that's it, and not mute. So that's why it's a real problem. So this is why on occasion when I've been doing a live broadcast, another audio source sneaks in. For example, let's say that I've added a, another camera to the mix. This camera has a mic on it. That audio is getting picked up and fed in, and I got a secondary audio source that I don't want. If I'm not monitoring it, which I'm not at that point, I don't hear it, it's a problem. So the, what's this, well there isn't a solution um, so far. Blackmagic does make their own cameras. They make these uh, uh, studio, Blackmagic Studio something. Anyway, they're micro four thirds cameras, take the same lenses as my Lumix gear. They are tiny little cameras, completely controllable from the ATEM software, which is insanely cool. If you put a power zoom lens on it, Panasonic and uh, Olympus make power zoom lenses, you can actually control the zoom from the software. And they have tested at my request, very specific request, they went into the labs and they gathered the gear, they put it all together, and they ran a very specific scenario for me to ensure that there was no latency. So according to them, audio going into their Blackmagic camera, syncing up with video, going back into the ATEM, being monitored from the ATEM is perfectly in real time. Now, I believe them, they tested it, I asked them, we're very clear about it. Thing is, I really don't wanna go out and buy two or three new thousand plus dollar cameras. But I may have to, to make this whole thing work. But anyway, that's irrelevant. The point is that that's the challenge that I have always dealt with. And the same t challenge snuck in today because of the frame difference between the on camera here and the off camera, the labs and the boom. So the solution to that for this live scenario, not, I mean, I'm the guy who's actually talking and monitoring, uh, is pretty easy. I just don't have audio from the camera coming in. All audio coming in on the cameras is turned off and I have a separate mic that is picking up audio for the room tone. Dead easy thing to do. Uh, I kind of, I mean, I knew this was going to happen and I, I expected it and it was there. Like I said, it wasn't a big enough deal. It just sounded kind of like a little reverb. So it was okay. But, um, that would be the right solution for that type of scenario. Oh boy, this rabbit hole got deep. I think that's it. That's really, that's the stuff that I wanted to kind of go through of why things didn't work and the challenges that we had. The only other real challenges were just timing. Doing what I was doing on my own is stupid. You should have someone who's dedicated to sound and that's all they do is they listen to the sound. Someone who's dedicated to switching the sources and that's all they do. I should have had people on each camera and um, that's probably it. That, so there's a lot of different people. It's, there's a reason live production is a big deal. Doing it on your own is stupid, and I do it every day with me, I'm on myself. Anyway, but it's fun. You know, hey, what are you going to do? You only live once, right? So that's that. I think that's that. It's, I know there's a lot of crazy tech stuff for the two of you that are actually still holding on and watching this. If you're watching this far, it's probably because you're actually doing this or interested in doing this. If you have solutions to my problems, oh, for the love of God, please tell me. I would love to hear them. If you've had the same problems and I've offered you some solutions, you're welcome. I'm happy to help. If you have questions, pop them into the comments. You know I love to, to respond to those things. And uh, yeah, I guess that's about it. So whew, I got three hours of sleep last night and my studio is utterly destroyed. My recording studio has been completely stripped. I got to reset up everything. And I've got recordings on Monday to do. So here we go. See you guys next week. It, it probably won't be from the recording studio. It'll probably be me sitting on my iPhone on the couch. See you guys later. Bye-bye.